Two years later, here it is. Um, so you should, in your conference pack, um, have our, our second fact sheet, which, um, thanks to Mark, actually looks a lot prettier than, than the first one. Um, our publication skills are, are going up all the time. Um, and when producing this, I mean, the, the, the thing that I found most difficult was actually striking a balance between giving employers um, an idea of what was involved in the condition um, but not actually scaring them rigid so that they would think, I don't want this person because he's going to uh, be, a, be a load of trouble to us. So it's quite difficult to sort of um, get the balance. I hope we have got the balance, um, but um, obviously I, I'd, I'd welcome feedback from, um, from people here as to, to whether they, they, they think it, it, it actually has struck, struck that balance. Um, so the, the emphasis in the, in the fact sheet is very much on, on sort of practical ways in which employers can help and just how small adjustments sometimes can make all the difference to, to you working in, in, in a, a, an environment um, as to how well you, you cope. I mean, I'm well aware that lots of people with keratoconus don't tell their employers about the, their condition, and we're not for a moment with the fact sheet suggesting that, you, that people should. I mean, that's entirely um, up to the individual. But at least it, it, it's there for you if you actually do get to a stage where, where you might want it and, and, and might want to, to tell your employer what, it, what it's all about. Um, we will be putting it on the website, I think, um, so that people can actually download it. Um, as a footnote, I actually had my first call from a job centre last week from somebody who was um, advising someone with keratoconus and, and rang, rang us to, to find out more about the condition. So I said I would send her one of our fact sheets um, plus the um, previous conference report. So that, that, was, um, that was an encouraging first, actually. Um, and what I'd like to do now is in to introduce um, Gareth Bainan, who was actually um, responsible for galvanising me into finally getting my finger out and actually producing this, this sheet, um, because he had already um, done wonders in actually doing a presentation to his own employers about um, his situation. Um, so over to, to Gareth. Right, I'll, I'll do my best, because... Um I'll come on to part of, um, it's been covered already by Dr. Ramesh, the importance of not overwearing your lenses. Now, I do have a strict management regime and I try and be flexible. I think I was perhaps a bit too flexible and paying the price at the moment. So we don't know our limits till we actually hit them. Um, I do feel honoured being here because I've only been involved in the group for about a year, um, although I've had Keratoconus for nearly 20 years now. Um, and up until now, it's never been a, a great problem. So I'll give you a bit of background about my particular case. Um, in 1988, I had a sight problem. Two black eyes, basically. I was playing rugby, and in the scrum, I got into a fight. A bit of a thug. Um, but... Time November came, I actually saw the specialist. It was diagnosed as I had KC. And at that point, there was no support groups, no nothing, didn't know anyone else. Um, my world practically came to an end, really. So it progressed rapidly. December 88, um, it was decided I needed graphs. Um, my vision was deteriorating. But at that stage, it was still being managed. But it soon came to the point I was getting through lenses so quickly that I'd be fitted. I'll then, by the time I collected the lenses, they weren't really any good. My eyesight had already changed. And you gradually get to the point where I was, was classified partially sighted. The lenses just wouldn't stay in. And because it's coming up to exam time, it was decided to defer the graphs that we'd put them till after I'd done my exams. Let me get my A-levels out of the way first. Um, so, July 89, it was actually a week after my very last exam. I'd just celebrated doing the last of my exams, and then I went in um, for a full graft. By the September, I'd started a degree in London, and I found it quite humorous. I'd already set my sights on doing a microbiology degree. I kept on and I went straight for it. 
The thing about Curtis Cohn is it throws up all sorts of problems. I look at those as challenges that we can overcome if we apply ourselves. And it can be disheartening, but that, that's why we need to approach it, I feel. I got my first year exams out of the way, and then straight back in and had the left eye done. Um, at the end of my second year, I had the first set of stitches out, and within six weeks, I was working at industrial placement year for the DTI. And this might horrify some of our specialists here today. The work I was doing was environmental work, and I'd be down the sewers. I'd be where there was muck, I was there. Where there's a possible source of infection, I was in the worst place. <laughs> I still have my graphs, though. <laughs> Um, September 92, I had the last of the stitches removed. This for me fitted in nicely because for the first time I could have what I considered normal sight correction. I was wearing glasses. I could do my final year of my degree like anyone else. And to me, that was a big bonus. Uh, that was a high point of, of my degree year. So initially working, yeah, did it cause me any problems? Absolutely none. And through being involved with the group and from finding out more of the information, I'm more of the opinion that those of us who get in touch with the group are those who are actually finding there's a problem we're finding it difficult to overcome. It doesn't mean it can't be done. We can if we apply ourselves. Did I declare KC and graphs to my employers at the point of application? I was doing environmental work where there was a chance of infection, I was working there. So it was only fair that I let my employers know because it could affect what I was doing in later life. And as I said, I worked down sewers, I've been up chimneys, I've fallen off chimneys, I've been down the mines, I've worked on oil rigs up until about the past five, six years when I opted for a career change. Then, and this is quite rare for it to happen, and I think it's borne out by some of the presentations we've had this morning. I had a sight problem diagnosed again in March, and it was a gradual thing and got referred to the hospital. By August came, I was sent home from work. I was told by my GP that it was just down to stress. I was worrying too much about the up and coming visit to the hospital. And I was advised to go on holiday. I'll come on to that later. This will scare you, scared me. Appointments got pulled forward. By September, I got keratoconus again in the right eye. Now, that's not in the graft. The graft is absolutely fine. It's where we were going on earlier about when it's on the periphery. At that time, when I had my graft gun, it, it, it wasn't possible to actually map the cornea, see how steep, how far has it progressed. It comes down to experience. And if it wasn't showing up there, you can't really do any surgery on it. So that's where the case has come back again, and it's pulling my graft out of shape. Um, and that time, in September, I found I shouldn't have gone on holiday. For some people who know me from the board, I race cars, or I used to race cars until recently. I took a 30-year-old car, drove it all the way to Germany, raced it around the most dangerous circuit in Europe, keeping up with the modern cars, and I came back. Perhaps it's because I couldn't see the corners that I went around so quick. <laughs> Can't see fear, you don't know to, to feel it. Um, October, I got my lenses. And I've been managing okay. It took me a while to get used to them. But in this period, I was off work. I didn't go back till about November time. I was off for a, over three months. So November, I went back. So how's that affected me at, at work? Well, I found I had to do several things, also for myself, but for my employers, and that was to educate them. Find out the equipment I needed, and then get the right equipment. Know your limits and needs. Uh, unfortunately, one of the ways we find our limits is we overstep them. And then, this is, I felt was important, planning a return to work. And this is recommended by the occupational health nurse at the company I work for. And then also the managing at work. It goes for being students as well. It, this hopefully for any students that are here will show, if you've got KC now, it, there's absolutely no reason for it to hold you back. 
The world is your oyster. It's how you challenge it, how you overcome the obstacles that's the key, and you can go for it. So on the education side, I went through occupational health. I taught the occupational health nurse everything I knew about keratoconus. That was practically reprinting the whole of the support group website. It's finding stuff from the US, everywhere around the world. If there was information, I'd print it. I'd then go through and find what was relevant. I didn't want to give them the whole story because, as Anne said, you don't want to scare them and get rid of someone. Um, we actually worked out how much it would cost the company I work for to get rid of me, how much it would cost them in lost revenue to get someone else to retrain someone. It would cost them over half a million dollars. I don't get paid anywhere near much. I'd like that. <laughs> I was also educating my supervisor, my occupational health nurse. She helped me put things into more layman's terms. She was a medical person, she understood the things. So she helped me put it into better things for my supervisor. And not everyone has occupational health um, people working it. So this is where you need to interact with your supervisor. They might not seem willing to actually want to understand, but a lot of it comes in, they generally don't understand, they don't know how best to express that. But it's worth doing. Human resources as well, keep them informed. I wish I'd had more contact with my human resource department because I've only been permanent for four years there. I've only, although I've been there for five years, I don't qualify for their full benefits yet. I've got another year to go. So 13 weeks paid sick and then I was on statutory sick pay. I didn't find that out till a week before it was about to happen. So get the questions in there. Ask as many questions up front. And then educate your colleagues. A lot of companies now, you have to have some form of training. You have to document the training you have. So this is one way where you don't have to educate the whole organization you work in. Where I work, <coughs> excuse me, there's 3,000 people at 3M UK. 67,000 work for 3M in the globe. If you look at some of the statistics, one in 3,000 have KC, so I'm the one in my company that's got it. Globally, statistics say there should be about 20. I've got an advert in, in the corporate publication to see if, if that's true. But my immediate colleagues need to understand why I can't do things. I work in a laboratory. They need to understand why I can't do things for health and safety. Now that's documented in their training records. That's documented in mine that I've educated them. So from a legal point of view, me as the employee is protected, and so is my employer from various discrimination type of things. They can't say they didn't know, they didn't understand. And you can keep it relatively simple. If they're genuinely interested, they will come and ask you, and then you can go into more detail. So getting the right equipment, assess your work area. I had loads of stuff on my desk when I came to assess it and look at it objectively. I had loads of stuff on my desk which I didn't really need. I thought I did, but I didn't. So I made a list of what did I actually need? What was the definite must-haves? And that's pretty much what's on my desk now. Looks like I don't do any work because it's so tidy, but don't tell me boss that. Any visual aid requirements? Health and safety executive have on their website how to do a visual display um, test. So you can assess your workstation so you're comfortably. So it's not just protecting your eyes, it's protecting all of you. So you don't get back aches, you don't get eye strain, you don't get headaches, um, you don't get upper limb disorder, which I've got as well. It's all about it, looking at where you work, how do you work properly. And this can mean getting a 19-inch monitor, which is on the leaflet. The one I've got, I can actually change the colour ratios. So everything looks slightly blue to people who, most people that look at it. To me, it looks perfectly normal and they're surprised at what I can see, because it's turned as dark as I can get it. But I can see it. No one else can actually see what's on my screen. So it's tailoring your environment, your little work cell, to your needs. It doesn't matter about anyone else. They've got a mouth. They can ask. It's our eyes that aren't working quite as well. But when we put the right equipment there, no one need know. And also imaging software. It's possible to get that. That's freely available. That's where there's some in the employee leaflet, there's good information 
um, RNIB have helped me in the past. There's access for the blind. There's all sorts of things where you can even get funding to help your employee actually put that, your, your company put that stuff in place. So it's not a financial burden to them. So you're taking one less worry off them. They don't understand the condition. We do, which is why they let us make the changes, make the suggestions. No one knows what we need more than we do. So you've got your work environment. It's also how do you get from the car park, if you can still drive or if you need public transport, how do you physically get to work? Where do you sort out your lenses? If you've got to do something, with, take lenses out or put eye drops in, where do you go? Toilets, even in the best kept company, aren't the most hygienic of places. Is there a first aid room? If there isn't, can one be put in? It's something everyone can use. It's, it's little things, and it doesn't cost much to do. So knowing your limits and your needs. So I have a strict regime of managing my lenses to so try and not to overwear them. But I try and be flexible so that if I need to wear both lenses for a long period, I like to think I can without overstretching the mark. But that's something I can come on to later. It's so taking regular breaks. You, you know, what can you do safely? I have a timer on my desk. 30 minutes it's set at. I set it when I start using my computer. When that timer goes, I turn the monitor off. I'm then not tempted to actually look at it while it's still on, even the screensaver. I'll get out and have a coffee break. I'll usually got stuff to take to the mail room. There's usually stuff for me to collect from the mail room. I know there's, at some point I'm going to have a question to ask colleagues. I'll save those up for when I have that break. So you're still being productive. You don't have to feel, right, half an hour, I've got to switch off for five minutes. You're always being productive. And if anything, we can be more productive because you're managing, you've got that strict timetable of what you're doing and when you can do things. I know it's been commented on my appraisal yesterday that I'm more productive than I was before. So I'm starting to think, well, okay, perhaps this uh, condition I've got, it's a good thing. If you need handouts, ask. I get invited to lots of meetings. When I accept the meeting, I always put on there, is there going to be a presentation? If there is, email it to me. I don't ask them to make the changes so it's pleasing on the eye for me because depending where it is in, throughout the day, my, all of our eyesight changes. If it comes to me, I can make the changes so it's pleasing to me, and I print off a hard copy. And I can do it in a format that's comfortable for me. I've got, um, so I work for 3M, they do window tint film. Some places I go for meetings, it's not appropriate for me to wear my sunglasses. It becomes too dark and I can't actually see the people in there. But Looking at black and white, it's very difficult. Even if I turn it the other way and try and have white on black, it's too much. But I found with the window tint film, and I've had it made up to a little um, A4 size wallet, if I slide it in there, I'm looking at black on a bluish gray. And that helps me a lot, and that's something I've found a lot better. The company's gonna look into that further. I meant to bring some tint film down with me, but I couldn't find it this morning. And if I'd done my lenses in, I might have had more success. <laughs> But that's something my employer's looking at actually using an existing technology to a different purpose, if it might help people. If it'll help me, it might help a lot of other people. So if you've got a long time off work, you, you don't want to go straight back in. So I started with just one full day. And this is what's written into the company uh, procedures. If someone's off for more than a month, the company I work at, you have to start with just working one full day, with a half day either side. So the first half day is getting all your HR stuff, all your things out of the way, so yes, I'm safe to come back to work. I'm not going to be causing any problems for anyone else. You get that done in the first half day. Then the next day, you can do your full workstation assessment. You can make sure everything's there for you. You can see what you need to do so you can start to get the right equipment in. Look at what's available. It's possible if you do need further help from access to work and action for the blind and all that stuff, to get them in beforehand. Most companies are quite happy for people to get the stuff in place so they can get back up to as normal as you can as soon as possible. You increase by one full day every week until your normal working week is achieved, full five days a week. And by doing that, you gradually introduce your normal workload. Because when you're sat at home, you can keep yourself busy, but you haven't got the same pressures. 
So it's getting used to what's required. It helps your colleagues get used to what your requirements are, what your needs are. And as <coughs> I'm quite happy to say to people at work, I have a disability. Sometimes it affects me. Sometimes you'd never know. It was a training thing um, for the company in, in Bracknell. And it was a new building to me. I just said, I can't see where you're pointing to. And I got direct, kindly, the person actually led me all the way to the coffee to meet up where the rest of my colleagues were. Once I knew that route, once I knew where I was in the building and been places once, I was fine, I didn't need help. I sort of had this mental map of where I needed to go. I ended up getting an award in the end for innovation. And the people who judged what I was doing for a little technical challenge weren't aware I had a sight problem. So I was, I was quite chuffed. You can overcome a lot of things. It's also a good time. I mean, sometimes when you're going back to work, you've still got all those hospital appointments. I still had the follow-up for looking at me, make sure the lenses were fitting properly. I didn't have any um, adverse reactions to them. So plan those into the return to work. It's more relaxed. You don't feel that you're having to rush out halfway through the day. It's easy for lens management as well if you're still building up that, that wear time. And it's also good for including any retraining. A lot of companies I know sort of say, right, we want you to work on this from this period to this period. Well, if you're being reintroduced to work, you don't actually show up on any of those lists where they're trying to apportion where your work goes. So you can achieve a lot in, in that period so that you're as good as anyone else. And again, as I said, the visual assessments are included in there. But make it flexible. That's the thing. Make it flexible. You're still... if it. The conditions new to you in the workplace, you're still learning what your limits are. And you're going to have your good days and you'll have your bad days. Probably more good than bad, but you still need to be flexible so you can adjust how you're doing things. So, a typical thing for me, put a lens into one eye. Now, this subject's come up a lot on the support group website at the moment. I can't cope with one lens. How can you cope with one lens? I'll be off balance. I can't do this. I can't do that. Always throwing up the object. You know, the brain can be easily educated. It might look complex, but in many respects, it, it, it's quite stupid. I can try a little experiment here. I'll ask you two, two questions. And I want you to answer to someone sat next to you. I'll ask the second question as, as quick as I can, and I want everyone to shout out the answer. Okay. What colour is your fridge? What do cows drink? Milk. You're thinking fridge, you're thinking white, you're thinking cow. What's in the fridge? Milk. You can re-educate the brain. It's like if you hold up colours and you can write the word red in blue. A lot of people get that wrong because they're looking at the colours instead of the word. That's how easy it is to fool the brain. You can educate your brain to actually work on one lens. So I can change very quickly from one lens to the, to the other. And it only takes me about 10, 15 minutes. It's like flicking a switch. You just turn that eye off, and the other one comes on. So I drive to work. I start work at 8 o'clock. I look at what my task list is. I keep a complete to-do list. Anything that's on there for more than two weeks just gets wiped off. It's not important. If it is important, someone will tell me. It'll go back on there again. So, and I keep it to a strict level of about 15 to 20 items. And depending on what I can see dictates what I actually do. I don't work in a laboratory, though, when I've only got one lens in, because of the nature of the chemicals and the drugs I work with. I work in the pharmaceutical industry now. So that's health and safety. I choose not to do that. I consider it too dangerous. One o'clock, just because it works out for my picking up my daughter and my home life, I'll put the other lens in and I'll let it settle. While it's settling, it's one o'clock. Hey, lunchtime. Doesn't affect your work then. Doesn't affect your lunch either. I do work with a binocular vision, and that's when I go into the lab. And that's when I play around with the chemicals I set up for the next day. At three o'clock, I typical day, I'll then take the original lens I had in the morning. That for me equates to around about eight hours. That's what I've been told is best for me. I did 
admit, I, I bullied the optometrist and said, I can easily go eight hours, it's really comfortable. I've had 10, no problems. And he says, well, you'd go on 10, on your head be it. He said, if you go 12, as long as it's one-offs, it's not regular things, you might be okay. The stress might be okay. So I'm paying the price now. But you don't know your limits till you exceed them. Half four, I go home from work. That, for me, works out as an eight-hour day. I'm well within the European Work Directive. I'm, so my supervisor thinks I'm more productive than I was. So I'll put things in which people with decent eyesight should be using. It's just that I use it, and it's actually making me more productive. Think how much more productive your colleagues could be. And that means I get home from work at about 6 o'clock. I can spend time with my daughter and, you know, enjoy family life. What if it all goes wrong, which it did on Wednesday? You go to work, it hurts. Well, that, that's the case it, it was for me on Tuesday. Got to work, it, it was irritating. Left lens was a bit painful. So what do you do? Obviously, take the lens out. Take it out and clean it. I take it out, I don't bother putting it back in once I've cleaned it. Give the eye a chance. It has been irritation, give it a chance to recover. Only then do I tell my supervisor that I've actually taken my lens out and I can't see what, the, what on earth I'm doing. I've got to up the font, I've got to change the resolutions on the screen, I've got, to, I've got to change my whole work day. But my sight's more important than work. It's very hard to actually accept that because, you know, we were working for a reason, to pay the bills, to pay the mortgage. Change the resolution on my PC. The reason it's in that order is my supervisor's office is on the way from the first aid room to my desk. It's just convenient. I'm lazy. I check a lot of work. I, and if I haven't got checking scheduled for that day, because working in the pharmaceutical industry, we're governed by so many regulations. These gentlemen here know what you're governed by. It's, it's a nightmare. You could well do with that. I go and get all the documents that other people are supposed to do, and I swap work with them. I take that work and I copy it onto A3. I've seen on, on the website people saying, my employer's not doing this, my employer's not doing that. I know it's disheartening, but feel your employers aren't doing enough for you. But like I said, we know the condition better than they do. We, as tedious as it seems, it's quicker and easier for us to go and make those changes than for them. The innovative way would be to actually go around and say, well, right, now you have the same condition I do. I can't see. Let's turn all the lights out. Let them see on a level with us, but, you know, we're ruled by health and safety. And this is, I've stolen this. I don't know if Jay's down here t today. I, I know he's on the website frequently. You know, just look for Jay and Chatterbox. You, you'll find him. He's quite humorous. He, he's good for cheering you up when you're feeling down as well. And I think his signature sums things up. It's about facing the challenges it creates rather than accepting the problems it generates. Or as the Americans have started saying now, especially in 3M, it's a solution opportunity. So I'd just like to thank you know, everyone for listening to me. I don't know about you, but my stomach's rumbling now, so I'm ready for something to eat. Marion from the Midlands group, she actually asked me to actually help with uh, registering people, but uh, Anne poached me. So. <laughs> but Marion has asked me if I'll give a presentation for the Midlands group, so I'll, I can go into a lot more detail about how, what I found was good for students, how that helped me get through to university, how that's helped me carry it through life, actually, to do the job I do now. And to Anne for pulling this together, and actually for asking me, I only volunteered for one thing, and she says, well, you volunteered to help. That means you give a presentation, so. But she asked me very nicely. And John for tweaking a few bits on, on this presentation to make it easier, hopefully, for, for you to see. And also for taking out a duplicated slide, which I didn't find out. And again, you lot. It's, it's everyone in the support group that's helped me. A lot of what I've come up with that's helped me at work, I've whinged on the forum. People have said what has helped them. And if you find something that helps you, keep a record of it. If you find something that helps you and it's important for you at work, make sure your supervisor knows about it, that you're getting things in to help you. Because it's not there just to make sure your employer can't get rid of you. 
as I said, it's often cheaper to keep you than it is to try and retrain someone. And it's helpful for other people. I've repeated myself several times on, on the board. Someone's come up with the same question. I've gone back and looked through what I've kept and said, hang on, this works. Try this. It's not going to work for everyone, but you don't know until you try it. So it's, give it a go. And don't lose face if, uh, or don't lose heart if it doesn't work. It might lead you to something that does work. So thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you very much, Gareth. I knew you'd be a star.